Hello and welcome to the final episode of the Digitizing India series presented by Cisco in partnership with CNBC TV 18 and Money Control. Since it is India's Independence Day, we thought it would only be appropriate to end the series with a look at how social innovators in the country are using digitization to benefit the everyday citizen and to bring about sustainable growth across the nation. So on the show today, we meet Deepak Basu of Anudeep Foundation that's providing IT training to rural poor and also helping them get jobs. Nishadat of Startup Wave tells us how they're using technology to guide entrepreneurs to spruce up their business plans and also connect with them to potential investors. MN Reddy, former police commissioner of Bengaluru, gives us an insight into how the Bengaluru police is using the internet of everything to ease the lives of Bengaloreans. Plus, Nalini Kant Golagunta of Cisco tells us how social organizations are using the internet of everything to positively impact the remotest corners of India. Headquartered in Kolkata, Anudeep Foundation is a non-profit organization that's teaching spoken English and imparting IT training to rural and disadvantaged youth in the northeast of India. Over and above the training, they also help place these youth in relevant jobs. So that uh, digitization of what used to be lecture notes and, and stuff into multimedia curriculum is one aspect of what we do. Uh, we're also working with a couple of major online curriculum providers who provide cloud-based curriculum. So a lot of our curriculum, as well as our own, as well as from partners, is housed in, on, in the cloud. The combination of these uh, technologies, the media, and uh, also the other thing is that many of our students feel uncomfortable in a complete e-learning situation. They need to ask questions, so we have video conferenced master trainers who are available to answer questions and uh, give introductory comments. The lack of power, electrical power, lack of internet access um, are a constant problem in rural India. Um, it is improving, of course. Uh, mobile phones are definitely universal, but internet is not. And so uh, what we have is technology uh, routers which, are, which work without um, power, uh, which can be used as storage devices on, on which the, uh, uh, the curriculum can be downloaded from the cloud and stored and used to stream uh, video to uh, the, the laptops and tablets where students are learning. Projectors which are battery powered so that they can, uh, the class can go on uh, even when the power goes out. And internet access is it's sporadic, so off hours or when the internet comes back, the um, curriculum can be downloaded from the cloud. Uh, my family is not a big family. Anudeep Foundation has tie ups with many employers and they train the students as per the employee needs of these companies. Anudeep guides students through the interview process and also for the first six months at the new job so that the employee does not get overwhelmed by the change of environment. So what we do is we train young people, men and women, and in information technology and in spoken English, two things which are critical for the job market, but most importantly, changing behavior through workplace readiness training as to how to behave in the work, how to workplace, how to dress, etc., etc. And then we work very closely with employers through our Market Alliance Skills Training Program so that we have a good idea of what skills they need, or how many numbers of people they need, what, uh, what is the job role, and we train the people based on those specific job roles. And then we present them to the employer, uh, and there is a very high probability of them getting selected. And we've been maintaining 80% uh, placement success over 40,000 plus people that we've worked with in the last eight years. What used to happen was an impression that rural kids really can't uh, make it. Uh, that's changed, and at least with the employees we work with. We have a list of 200 plus, about 300 um, large employers we deal with in retail, IT, various spaces. And uh, they go in and they prove that they are able and willing and able to do the work, and that makes them like us, and then the next batch and the next batch. Having started operations in May of 2007, Anudeep Foundation now has a presence in the seven northeastern states and a center in Delhi, while also moving into Chhattisgarh, UP and Telangana. 
we have cumulatively reached 45,000 people trained and about 80% of them placed either in jobs or if they are unable to travel to jobs or businesses because of uh, you know traditional or conservative, conservative reasons, especially women, we help them start small businesses in their communities and uh, have a livelihood from that aspect of um, IT-based uh, business options. And um, we are projected to grow significantly over the next few years. Uh, we're targeting about um, 100,000 people trained in about three years and about 200,000 people trained another three years beyond that. In Onudhi Foundation, we are using technology to teach our, or to train our students. We call it Virtual Mast. We are using a particular platform that is called Zaya through which uh, students can learn different um, in topics like English, workplace readiness, and as well as IT. So the benefit is basically um, they can operate everything of their own. They can learn very quickly. At the same time, it improves their confidence. In this foundation, here the um, use um, audiovisual course that is more preferable to me and um, because um, we can um, we can listen and we can see also the teachers teach very well here uh, also the IT teacher and the spoken English teacher so I want to complete my course and this is very needed in my future the good news is they already have a very good technology platform they've built already right using which they're providing these IT skills training overall. General point I make to these guys is whenever you do this with technology, people don't realize the power of the platform they've built, the connected platform they've already built, right? And today they're using it for a very narrow sliver, which is around IT skills development. But the needs in the communities they're operating in is much wider than that. So using the same technology platform, they can use it for other skills development, you know, other augmentation, it could be like self-use, for example. There's a lot of people who have self-use training modules for different skills, vocations like carpentry, like welding and stuff like that. So the same platform can be used for providing for other, play, uh, other services. The other piece, honestly, is around other social outcomes beyond education, right? Again, communities which are distressed at this point in time, communities are underserved at this point in time, you can use the same technology, for example, on healthcare, right? Uh, can you help these families, not just that single principle that you're talking about, but the families as well, right? So really, it's a question of leveraging what they've built and scale it up in greater depth within the communities they, they work with. It's time for a short break, but on the other side, we meet Nisha Dutt of Startup Wave that's connecting startups from the four corners of the country to mentors and investors. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to the Digitizing India series this week. We're looking at how social innovators are digitizing. We meet Nisha Dutt of Startup Wave, an initiative that's providing startups with the support that they require when they require it. Irrespective of where they are located or what stage of evolution that they are at, Startup Wave guides the entrepreneur through a step-by-step -step process to growth. The only way to reach remote places is through technology. Today, that's the only technology is the only way to break these barriers of infrastructure, of reach, and access. So that's one of the ways that we have done it. Startup Wave can be accessed. It's a virtual incubation platform. Anybody from any part of the world and the remotest part of the country can access the platform. So access is absolutely democratic. You get the same support that you would get sitting in Moradabad. Uh, that you would, you know, you would get in Bangalore otherwise in the city. So it's open access. It's you know reaching as many entrepreneurs as possible. The second way we have democratized is through you know choice. Basically, you build your own incubation journey as you go through. So the choice is back to the entrepreneur. He builds his own roadmap as he goes along. So that's the second way we have democratized it. The third way is uh, we believe that we have created what is an industry infrastructure. So today the challenge is that if you are an entrepreneur sitting somewhere in a remote part of the country, let's say that you're sitting in Kalahandi, you want to figure out, you know, how do you access investors onto, you know, other entrepreneurs? How do you access business support services? 
where would you go? So we have created a single platform where we today have about 30 incubators plugged into it. We have supported 400 entrepreneurs and we have about 25 mentors actively volunteering their time on the platform. So it's one stop shop. It's almost like you know single window clearance for all incubation needs. Entrepreneurs contribute significantly to the Indian economy both in providing employment as well as to the GDP. As more and more startups are adopting some form of technology, how will digitization impact the entrepreneurship space in India? Digitization is, my, I believe, the only way we will be able to tap into this opportunity because what it lets us do three, three things which entrepreneurs typically struggle with. The first is access to this demography and population. When you have technology, it actually helps you break access barrier, just like we have been able to do with Startup Wave. The second is affordability, because often people have products and services that they want to get to remote parts of the country, but affordability is a question, because by the time you're getting done, you're getting done, getting your product to the last mile, it's so expensive that nobody can afford. The third and the most critical, and I think often overlooked, is awareness. Technology can really help you generate awareness. Mobile phones have been used to push messages to pregnant women on safe childbirth methods. So we have seen that itself has had an impact on the mother and child mortality rate. So technology is the way that barrier was also broken. One of the founders of Startup Wave is IntelliCap, an organization that helps build and scale sustainable enterprises dedicated to social and environmental change. We met one of the beneficiaries of Startup Wave, Chandar Thareja, who started an enterprise that's working to bring about social change. His website, donateitems.in, connects NGOs to donors using the internet. DonateItems.in is an online platform where you can donate stuff. For example, you have used shoes, clothes, mobile phone that is still in good condition. You can list it there on the platform. Only the NGOs registered on this site will be able to see what you have offered for donation. Whosoever needs it will get in touch with you. The other thing you can do on the platform is you can browse through the item requirements of various NGOs. For example, Teach for India needs storybooks, Lakshyam needs toys. Buy from any of the e-commerce portal, give the delivery address of the NGO directly on the shopping site and the item will reach them. Uh, when uh, I got introduced to Startup Wave, while I was filling the business canvas, uh, there was uh, so much stuff that I had to put in that prompted me to think more about the plans that I have for my own uh, company. Uh, so uh, I would recommend other startups also to go through it because it has so much of valuable information. It has got videos, it has got uh, the canvas itself will prompt you a lot of uh, pointed questions that you, you should think about and document all of those and take it to, uh, to your potential partners. Uh, then uh, Fiki Sankalp Social Global Expo happened and Kaushik got in touch with me from Startup Wave. He helped me put together all the content in uh, Startup Wave and he introduced me to a couple of mentors. Uh, the um, Both the mentors I met were very uh, useful. Both the interactions that I had were very useful. It helped me define the strategy for myself. So right now we're building an Android app and we're doing Shop Dilse. That's our own e-commerce portal where you'll be able to buy common donation items. Uh, that was possible only because of the couple of interactions that I had with mentors introduced by Startup Wave. What happens is the cost to serve becomes too prohibitive when you have that situation. And second thing they have is talent is not very available for them uh, in these remote locations as well. And that's another area where technology can help augment some of the talent that you have in these um, locations as well. And the third piece is in most of the social organizations, governance and compliance becomes a bit of an issue, right? If you're funding multiple different agencies or NGOs at the end of the day, how do you track them? How do you look at their spending? Where, are the, where is the money being spent? And technology can play a really good role to help digitize their entire process to make sure that compliance is transparent and there is a real-time view on where really the money is being spent, where the benefits are happening, how do you track this down, right? It's time for another break, but on the other side, we meet MN Reddy, Bengaluru's former commissioner of police, who tells us how they're using a remote kiosk to make it easier for citizens to avail of police services. Stay tuned. <laughs> 
Welcome back to the Digitizing India series. This week we take a look at how social innovators are digitizing and the Bengaluru police force is another case of social innovation. With the aid of technology, they're improving the lives of the common man and society in general. Using kiosks set up in high footfall public spaces, citizens in Bengaluru can chat with the police officer using telepresence and can file an FIR while also availing of other services. <music> As you know, uh, FI registration is not that easy in police stations in general in India because uh, there is a lot of resistance, good or bad. Um, so therefore, uh, the citizen who is already harrowed because he has already gone through a trouble or a problem that he is having to register an FI, somebody has already hurt him in some way or the other, uh, it's a double uh, whammy on him. It's a, it's a double punishment that if you if you cannot freely register a case. Therefore, we said that uh, this is a very good method where somebody can walk in and register a case without having to go to a police station. And at this point in time, we are looking at uh, registration of FIRs. But there are a lot of things in the pipeline in terms of, let's say, payment of traffic fines, for example, or any other, uh, any other matter that requires them to come face to face with police. We could think of uh, eventually making that possible through the FIR kiosks. <music> This remote kiosk is currently installed in Mantri Mall in Maleshwaram and plans are underway to install nine more kiosks in public spaces across Bengaluru over the next few months. MN Reddy tells us how the experience has been for citizens as well as for the police force. It has been excellent. I think we have already registered uh, over 500 cases in the last six uh, months or so. And out of this, I think uh, at least 300 uh, or so cases are real IPC, Indian Penal Code cases which are cognizable offences, the remaining are non-cognizable. Um, a lot of them are dealing with uh, thefts, for example, uh, two-wheeler thefts, um, theft of mobile phones, there are about uh, robberies, uh, there are cases about uh, heat teasing, there are cases about uh, atrocities on women, atrocities against scheduled caste. there are multiple types of cases, cheating, multiple types of cases. The police force, well, they do not have to go through the process of somebody having to come to the police station and waiting there and then going through the process of registration. Registration can take place independent of police stations and they just have to investigate. That's one way of looking at it. There could be an initial increase in burden of work because more cases may get registered. That could be playing on their minds, but I think that uh, um, it would be uh, better for us to register the cases as they occur rather than just hide them and say that crime didn't happen because once we register the crime then we have to investigate it in the process we have to detect it and in the process we will also be able to lay our hands on the offenders whom then we can prevent from committing offences. Besides the remote kiosk, the Bengaluru police is aggressively using social media to stay in touch with citizens and provide them with up-to-date information while also answering their queries. Well, I think we've already made a big mark uh, for ourselves as Bengaluru. As we're speaking today, as we're speaking now, we've just crossed a 1 million mark in our social media reach. So we have about half a million in Facebook and about half a million in Twitter. These are uh, really uh, providing us a huge reach to the public. Uh, instant reach, accessibility has improved a lot. So I think social media is a big weapon, big method available to us uh, through which we can reach out to the public, public can reach out to us. And there is a kind of a uh, balance created between us and there's a kind of a, a bridge built between us that uh, we are available to them and they are actually able to reach out to us at any point in time. What I generally tell social organizations when I talk to them is firstly get expertise on your board whether it's your know, board of directors whether it's in a leadership team get some expertise who can really give you a view on which kind of technology works well for you and you don't have to pay for these folks there are a lot of technical folks in the industry today who would be happy to volunteer donate some amount of the time and expertise to help these companies adopt some technology. I think the second thing is to get plugged into an ecosystem of technology partners, right? Again, at the end of the day, even after you have the idea, the nitty gritties of how do you deploy the solution? What do you go do to make the solution come into a reality? This is a place where 
partners can help a lot, like so system integrator partners, IT services partners. Again, a lot of these ecosystem partners are willing to help, Cisco being one of them, are willing to put the time and effort to help develop the solution for them. Um, the third thing I always tell them is always focus on one or two small specific problems you want to get into. Don't try to broad base all the technology adoption you do. Make small bets, get outcomes out of it, get comfortable with what you're doing, and then over a period of time kind of scale up the technology adoption you do, right? Well, that's all we have for you on the episode today. As we bring down the curtains on this series, we hope that we've been able to give you an insight into how cities, campuses, startups, businesses, and social innovators are digitizing. Heraclitus, the Greek philosopher, famously said that change is the only constant. As the world continues to upgrade itself faster than ever before, adopting digitization will allow companies, organizations, governments and citizens to keep pace with the change and evolve. From the entire team, many thanks for watching.